he's gone right the way through. Would you believe it? It's a goal for Doogie Friedman that could mean survival for Crystal Palace. Right, fast forwarding on a bit. So that was 2001. Um, a few years later, when did you very first start coaching? You only need to do the maths. I'm 45 now when I was 29. So me and Tony Popovich uh, thought we were the best coaches since sliced bread. <laughs> and we thought we'd better give this a go. So we got our, uh, we, we got our whistle. And a notepad and pen, and we went down to Millwall's training ground because there was a coaching course going on there. And we soon discovered we were not. <laughs> We'd all these ideas, and we soon discovered that we couldn't get it across in a certain way that people understood. So that became a long, passionate journey, which lasted about maybe nine years, Chris, on coaching courses, uh, development courses, you know mental strength courses, you name it. It wasn't just in football, you know, I really threw myself into try to teach. You know, I had this I had this knowledge and I tried to get it over. And I think that's the key to coaching. I think many people, many not just ex players, but many people can study the game and look at the game, but that's actually getting it over to, you know, teammate uh, you, you know, your colleagues in such a way that they understand it and they take it on board and they take action on on the they take action on what you've asked them to do. So at 29 years of age, me and Tony, we started and we just plugged away. And, and, and a, big, a big decision come my way, Chris, that thankfully I got this one right, that I went to Leeds for a few years at the end of my career, which was a good, real good time. I enjoyed it. Neil Wallet was great because Neil Wallet gave me the reserve job. I was 32, 33. And he said, well, I think you'll be good at it. And it was a fantastic six months because I literally done everything. I, I drove the van, I got in the van, I drove players like Bostock and Victor Moses were in the reserves at the time. I would drive them to uh, all the shot that was our home games. I'd play in the reserve game, take the team, play in the reserve game, uh, you know, talk to one or two of the younger players, drive the coach back, empty the van, put the skips away, and turn up the next morning on the Tuesday morning to train with the first team and you know, mm. carry on that way. Looking back, I thought oh, she's done off is quite me, but it was a great little quick, uh, you know, learning curve. I played at Leeds. We lost in the final against Doncaster on the Sunday. It was my birthday, honestly, the 25th of May on that day. And I had to start my two week coaching course at Lillyshaw on the Monday morning. So I had to drive up to Lillyshaw that night from London. And it was a big decision because I sat there on the sofa at eight o'clock at night, you know, just being lost at Wembley and thinking, right, what? What am I going to go in life here? And it was a big effort, Chris. You know, to pack the bag, not see the kids, drive up three hours up to another show, and stay up there for two weeks and and start the co start the coaching course, which was a great course. It was it was actually an invitation only course where Gary Neville, Zola, uh, Ryan Giggs, Solskjaer. There's a lot of people got invited onto this course. Uh, only twenty of us, which was which was a real real insight to how these guys work it really benefited me myself it was a good decision and then how did you find yourself back at Palace as assistant manager under Paul Hart yeah well I know I knew Paul Hart because at Nottingham Forest he was the youth team boss so uh, you know when he gave me a call Phil Alexander kind of was putting things together and Paul Hart gave me a call and just said, look, and I was still playing at South End. You know, I was still playing. I had a, had a two or three year contract left. I was still playing and enjoying myself. And Paul Hart came back and said, look, the club just went in administration. I've been, I've, been, I've been called to do a job for six months. I need some help. I need someone that's close to the players. Still fit enough to demonstrate some uh, drills. And I used drills, you know. I, I knew it. And at this time, I was really into my coaching. And, and you know, it's a sad thing when I look back, but at the time... I just retired then and then. As soon as Paul said, come along, I just retired. I just phoned up South End and said, I've retired. I'm going to go and go back. I've got a great opportunity to be the assistant manager at a club I'm very fond of and very close to, and I think I can help them in a very difficult period. And Ron Martin at the time said, well, Dad, you've got, you've got two years left of your contract. You know, we're, you know, we're playing this Saturday. And I just pretty much said to him, look, if you keep me, I, will not, I won't be able to play. I just won't be able to play. So... And I'm still good friends with Rob Martin because he done the, the honourable thing. He just literally tore up my contract and let me let me come along and and and, and jump into the deep end really because it was the deep end uh, 
uh, for six months, three or four months, sorry, uh, you know, trying to keep the club on and off the field in a very stable way. Actually, you, well, you mentioned your coaching drills. I spoke to Darren Ambrose recently and he, he credits that really with his, his goal against Sheffield Wednesday at Hillsborough. He said that the, um, your, fi- your finishing drills, which was even doing drills where you're finishing from three yards out, just so that you get used to hearing the ripple of the net and scoring goals over and over again. Is that something that you did as a player first and took into coaching? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Remember, I'll just give you a little hint there, because I was coached by Don Howe. You know, Don Howe and Dave Sexton at QBR with Mike Kelly. These three guys were Bobby Robson's right hand right hand men in the 1990 World Cup. So when they were coaching me, when I actually think back, we had to do uh, a, a, a sports B Tech when I was 16, and I was writing the drills down. So I was writing drills down, not for thinking I'm going to go into coaching. For actually my B-Tech in sport. So I was writing Don Howe and Dave Sexton's drills. And they just, you know, they were just there. My whole my whole kind of life, they were just there. And they were in a draw. And I would always add to them. You know, then I started adding, taking a bit more serious, you know, the drills I got over the years. And the best feeling in football, I believe, is when you make contact with the ball and you know it's going to hit the back of the net, but the 30,000 people don't yet, because it's still got 12, 4 yards, 5 yards to go, but you you know you've connected well, you, you've got right in this, the, the, the line of the ball, you know what's happening, it's the best feeling. And I often used to, don't have, I always used to put that in my drills, making sure the outcome was a positive outcome. So it was only from 3 or 4 yards, and I think, if I can remember right, Dad, I, I, would, I would go back to sort of 7 or 8 yards, uh, you know, to make sure he hit the back of the net, That's, that was the whole outcome of it. Uh, and then if it was anything outside the box, then I would just simply say to people like that, like, just hit the goalkeeper. You know, it used to drive me mad, people hit over the bar. I'd say, outside the box, hit the goalkeeper, and fingers crossed, inside the box, then your technical ability, you know, needs to be shown, whether it be a straight, low and hard, or, or you call the ball, or, you know, whatever your technical ability is at the time. So, I did... Uh, yeah, I do recall that. I do recall them, but you know, over the years, it's not just with Darren. Over the years, you know, I've worked with some good players and been lucky enough to pass some information on to them, which hopefully has helped them. It's funny you mentioned that that moment after you strike the ball and you know it's going in because that actually that does remind me because I I used to sit behind the goal in the Homesdale end when I was a kid. And I th- I'm pretty sure that reminds me of a goal you scored. It must have been the playoff semi final in ninety. 90- Seven against Wolves. I'm sure there's one yes. of those where it's going up and everyone knows it's going in. I'm sure we celebrated before it had even gone in the net. Yeah, pro- yeah, Chris. I think again, if you want a quick story, mate, uh, you've got me in a good mood today. But <laughs> I think that 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 week was a very interesting week in my life because if you can, if I can recall right, I played against Port Vale in the second last of the last game of the season. Now we're in the playoffs. It's done. I've got nothing to play for. And I foolishly enough lashed out at centre back and I got sent off. Which means at the time I couldn't play in the final if we got there. So I remember walking through the bar after the game and taking a little bit of abuse from the fans, you know, why'd you do that? And you know, you're gonna miss the final. And I was real low, you know, I was very, very low, and it was it was I was only young, I couldn't really take in, take on what had happened. I was real, real low. Saturday afternoon, you know, you got to get in the pitch with me. Very nice day, get sent off, driving home. If, I, if we get to the final at Wembley, I'll be devastated. Fast forward a week later, Chris, I, I was on the bench and I come on and scored a couple of goals against Wolves. You're right, that's right. And I walked through the exact same bar as a hero. Hmm. And it taught me in life a little bit that there is ups and downs in football and that one week can be so low and so high and not to take things so serious because you always have a second opportunity. Uh, but that goal that scored against Wolves was straight from the training ground. You know, I'd, I'd done that. I'd done that through my youth career and done that, I think, that season, scoring goals. Uh, and another funny one, that six, six months later, I actually went to Wolves. Actually, mm-hmm. I went to Wolves six months later. And in training, I'd done the exact same and scored a goal where I lobbed the goalkeeper, who was Mike Civil. And I told him, it was a little bit cheeky at that time, I told him that I've warned you once, 
he come off your line and I'll do this to you again. <laughs> and let's see, chase me, Chris. <laughs> the left foot down Danny training ground. And he caught me and it, and it wasn't pleasant. So <laughs> it was a very good memory of that. And a good memory for loads of Palace fans is the, is the Sheffield Wednesday game at Hillsborough. So going into it, the team knows they only need a draw from the game to survive. So it's, I mean, it's you going into a game again. And it, but this is even more serious than the, the Stockport one because this because with the club in administration, that it really is like the whole future of the club is in the balance, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, absolutely. You know, there was we're in administration. You know, and there was oh, it was it was difficult. I'll try and take you through that that kind of couple of days before and a couple of days after, Chris, because it was a whole series of things. And of course, we talk about the the win and the the great Alan Lee. I think it was in Dan Ambrose. Am I right? Yes, it was. Mm. So, leading up to that game, there was a lot of pressure. There was, because if we got into the, the League One, then you don't know if the, the 2010, you know, consortium are going to buy the club. You don't know what's going to happen. They're in the stadium. It's very difficult. We got the train up on the Friday, as we always did. It was a strike that Friday, get up to Sheffield. The players travelled three hours, standing up the whole way. Uh, I got to the, we got to the, the other end at Sheffield. And because we'd missed a slot to train, we had to train at Barnsley, and it was just the commotion was just bubbling up, really was. We got back to the hotel, you know, Paul Hart was calm ish, uh, but he really tried to put the importance of, take the importance, you know, on himself, take the pressure on himself, which I could see was, was, you know, straining on him. And I've often felt as an assistant, you've got to really try and talk to the players, not like a manager, you know, you've got to try and. You know, make make sure they're okay and make sure they've remembered certain things. And and I looked around, Chris, that Friday, and I and I pulled a few of the lads. You know, there were strong guys in there. They'd be fit any one of he'd, he'd assembled. Uh, and I remember just saying things to them. Look, you know, you know, you got to stay together no matter what happens. You know, I'd experienced this at Stockport. You know, you got to go to the last minute. You got to expect these certain these certain things are going to come out of this game. You know, you can't lie down and and wait for, for Sheffield you know, Sheffield Wednesday's train to come in. You've got to make sure you're, you're on that track and you're, mm. you're, you're, you're pushing forward. Uh, and then we, you, we played the game. And when you play the game as the coach, it's kind of you're done. You, you, there's not a lot to do. You know, I see these managers bowling and shouting to the side. That's perception. The perception they want to be seen doing something. I think a real manager's job's done uh, at half time and, and maybe the last 10 minutes of a game, 20 minutes of a game. So... There was not a lot to be done during the game. Full credit's got to go to the players. You know, they stood up, they performed. Ambrose, yeah, we, we did that, you're right. And it's the same as a Man United goal, which I, I know you want to talk about. There were certain movement patterns that we'd done to put Dan into positions. And Darren was one that I felt that I'm sure it was Sean Scano that cut the ball back. Uh, but these were, these, were these were drills straight off the training ground, Chris. Straight off Dan House training ground, right 20 years later into Dan Ambrose's training ground, that he cut the ball back, uh, keep the head still, keep the shoulders pointed towards the goal, uh, don't keep, don't lift the head when you strike the ball, uh, don't celebrate until two or three seconds after the ball hits the back in it. These little things you've already put in place, and and, that, and the outcome was wonderful, you know, really really wonderful. It was it was, it was a great achievement for the for the club. For the players, it put us in it put us in a position where the guys, uh, you know, they can sort of come in and bought the club, and it was really a real good feel factor. But there was still three or four weeks to go, Chris, when we finished that game. You know, there was still there wasn't there was still time that was that was difficult. But that particular win put us in a very good position uh, for for someone. And, and lucky enough, you know, Steve Paris and he can sort of pick us up. Uh, but it was a difficult time because everyone was laid off. And there was myself, Christine, the groundsman, Phil. I tell you what, I'm on the phone to Dan Ambrose because Neil Warren had won a QBR and Neil Warren had wanted to call, I wanted to take Dan Ambrose and he had a bid for him, five, six hundred thousand pounds. And I was on the phone to Dan Ambrose. Paul Hard had left. I'd say, Dan, look, you guys are going to come in. We're going to build a team around you. You know, you're a fantastic fella, good lad. You enjoy it here. Stay, you know, make sure we build the team. I'm going to stay as well, you know, I've been promising the new guys that have a part to play. And then my office phone started ringing, Chris. And I said, Dan, hold the line. I picked it up. It was a groundsman. 
and he asked me could he get forty pound to get some grass seeds because there was no money <laughs> they clubbed in the administration. So I had the phone in my ear with Phil screaming he needs grass seeds and Dan Ambrose and one other. And that just showed you the, the difference in the club at that particular time, you know. It was it was really it was really back to the wall. But thankfully I gave Phil's forty pound to buy some grass seeds and he was happy. And I gave Dan the speech to stay and he was happy. So the outcome again once once again was good. So Darren stays, George Burley comes in, along with probably quite a few players, I guess, because so many of the, the core players left that summer. So was it very much, when you took over as manager, still part of the, the very start of a real rebuilding job? Yeah, absolutely. I felt George was, I felt George at the time was the right manager. It was probably the wrong time for George. You know, I felt it was, it was right for Crystal Palace to acquire a man with good experience and then been there and done it. But I'm thinking George's life, he just came out of the Scotland job and it was difficult and I don't think he had the energy to rebuild. And it was it was a difficult period for the three or four months and, and obviously Steve Paris and the guys were new to it and I was trying to I'm trying to comfort a lot of people. That was my real job at that particular time, you know, comfort uh, comfort the, the guys and say we'll be okay, we've got some good players and and obviously trying to help George, which I probably didn't do a good enough job at trying to help him get the team uh, in the shape it needed to be. Uh, but when George left, it was a, it was a, it was a strange couple of weeks because I'd felt that my time had come to the end. I'd felt that you know what I probably need to have a some spend some time with a family. It's been twenty odd years, and it sort of slowed down a little bit. And then Steve Parish was fantastic. You know, he gave me a couple of games. He dug, he'd take a few games, see how it goes. I'm going to be looking for a manager. If the manager wants you to stay, I'm brilliant. If he doesn't, you know that's the way it goes. But I was very comfortable with that, you know, I was, I was in a good place at the time, and then he he, he, he talked to me about a few managers, he spoke to him, he spoke to me quite likes, and I was a bit unsure about certain types of managers he was bringing in, because I knew it was a real strong dress room, you know, Claude Davis, Paddy McCarthy, it was, it was still a, a, an unforgiving dress room, who weren't doing very well, and the more, and the more, the couple of weeks I got involved in it, I started feeling quite, you know, confident that I could do this job. And then a couple of, I don't even know if the results went for me, Chris. I remember just having a good relationship with Steve, and I remember just saying to him one day, "Look, Steve, I, I think I could, I think I could keep us up. I think, I, I think I'm confident enough to say that to you." And then when I say that to you, I think he was a little bit, you know, why didn't you say that before me? Because he'd spent <laughs> two or three weeks trying to find a manager, and pretty much the next day he came into the office. Uh, we didn't do contracts. He, he said, "Yeah, I want you to have the job. We've, we've thought about it, and I want you to keep us up." We shook hands. No contract with exchange. In fact, that whole year, we just I, I actually just immersed myself in the job uh, and started rebuilding. That's exactly what it was. I started rebuilding, having ideas about, you know, as I still have at the club, you know, my, I want to bring characters to the club, good personalities. I want to pe- bring people that's motivated, uh, people that have got the same agenda as the football club. And then I look at the athleticism, the technical ability of them, uh, you know, but I need to bring that, and that's how it started. And we we just rebuilt quite slowly. And I'd like it to be a lot quicker, but we didn't. We didn't really have a lot of money at the time, so I had to make sure the pieces come in at the right time to to move the club forward and keep us afloat as well. And then you get to the League Cup quarter final against Man United. Um, going into it, I mean, it was quite a brave move from you. You kept you kept Lewis Price in goal because he played in the cup, and then on the bench, it's a strong bench. You got Spironi, Ramage, Parr, Ambrose, Jedinak, Everson, and Murray. So, what what was your thinking going into that game of, base, of giving the youngsters a chance? Yeah, I'm, I've, I've always got a soft spot about that area, Chris. You know, I think you know one needs an one needs an opportunity to prove you know in life who they are and I felt at the time that was a, was a good occasion my, my death I was swung because you need, I need to give you a bit of a backstory we because of the TV we had to play on a Wednesday night but we'd already secured 170 odd thousand pounds to play Derby on the Friday night mm. which is actually two days later so here's me taking a team up to Man United on the Wednesday and having to play on the Friday and I recall we ain't doing too clever at the time, so I'm having to balance a very difficult situation where the club needs the money and, you know, the players would like to get a result. Uh, and then, uh, maybe I'm doing a bit of injustice there because I think at the time, Chris, I had, had Sean Scarrow coming through, I had Saha coming through, Shoot O'Keefe coming through. You know, I believed in these players. Jimmy Neeson, he did a run out. 
Lewis Pratt. I actually believed in these players and, and how I managed was pretty much, you know, there's 20 in the dressing room and, and, you know, we're going to go to battle every Saturday and we need everybody. So it was very unfair of me just to sort of, when the big occasion come along, you know, shot one or two players that I actually believed in, Jonathan Parr. So, you know, I wasn't brave. I felt it was the right decision and, and it was the right decision to, you know, take some energy into that game, making sure that we were on the front foot against them. And I felt we'd done that very well with the game plan. They did, they had a good team, in fact, if I can remember. They had a good team out. So with a good game plan that, you know, we used the centre of the circle as our area that we would not let them have the ball in. You know, literally we just pressure that area and not let them get started. Uh, because we felt if they get anywhere near a goal, they've got some lethal players. So we used that area to, to compress them. Uh, and then I, I think I can recall... You know, we're getting a lot of pressure put on us. There was an injury to someone. I can't remember. There was an uh, injury. To, uh, Moxie. Full sub. Who? Dean Moxie. Just Dean before Moxie. Time. There you go. Yeah, and I remember I had to... Uh, and I, and I, I can remember I had to sort of just change it. I needed to get a little bit more attacking on there with Darren. And I remember... I don't know if Darren thought of that. I made a couple of subs quite quickly, Chris, because I just felt... I felt the game was there. And I felt the game needed some... You know, we needed to attack them a little bit more. Than we had done, uh, and Darren come on, and but we'd still, you know, Jonathan Parr. I remember Jonathan Parr making runs. He was making runs overlapping Darren, which was allowing Darren to come inside. And we spoke a lot about our two wingers driving inside. We spoke a lot, a lot of that the whole season because I felt that I've often felt if you put people like Dan Ambrose in the right position and you get the ball to him, then you kind of Monday to Friday drills, you let, you let him do what he's got to do. We all know what happened, but I think credit to his teammates because they knew the patterns of play we'd, 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 we'd drummed up. And an overlapping Jonathan Parr allowed Dan Ambrose to come inside. A Wilfred Saha, you know, driving the ball into Darren behind the, behind the, uh, the strikers. The centre forward, I'm imagining right now, I'm trying to picture the, the scene, I'm trying to imagine the centre forward would be spinning away to the two centre backs away leaving Dan Ambrose with six or seven yards of space to, you know, produce probably one of the best goals that uh, Old Travers ever seen. Yeah, and that's what everyone talks about, Darren Ambrose, but that night really was, it was the night when Wilfred Zaha burst onto the scene for yeah. the rest of the world to see him. Was, was, yeah. did Sir Alex let you know that he was impressed by him that night? Well, because I don't drink, I don't drink hot drinks, cups of tea and cups of coffee. It's just not my style. And it was the only time I've ever drunk a cup of tea. Because <laughs> Sir Alex called me in the dressing room before the game, and he said, "Sit down, son." And he poured me a cup of tea. And he said, "One or two sugars." I don't drink tea, and I said, uh, "No, one sugar will be fine." And here's me drinking a cup of tea. <laughs> I'm drinking a cup of tea. I don't like a cup of tea. And he's telling me about my team. So the, the man was unbelievable. He's telling me. You know, you're going to play Saha and he's smiling. What about Scano? And this is before the game when the teams have not even been produced yet. So he knew us. He knew Saha. He knew Scano. He knew certain players that we had. You know, he's, he's done his homework. And I'm trying to really, I'm very inexperienced and I'm trying to say nothing. Uh, you know, and smile away and pretend I'm enjoying his cup of tea. <laughs> but certainly after the game, you know, it he was, he was, he was wonderful after the game. You know, and just praising that player's energy attitude to keep on going. We had to hang in at times, you know, it wasn't just the Dan Ambrose goal, you know, they pegged us back to one each. It's, mm. it's very, very difficult. So we, we showed some mental strength. Uh, but certainly Wilfred Saha, you know, produced a performance everybody knew he was capable of, but now in the big scene. In the, big, in the, in the, in the scene that's sort of one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and, that, and that was a time about that time I, I had to sort of really manage Wilfred's, you know, he's, he's a great fellow, Wilfred. He's a, he's a really great guy, heart of gold, but of course, the circle around him at the time, the circle, you know, the media frenzy around him was 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 really, the attention was on him, and, and I don't mind saying, I think I was maybe harder than I should have been on Wilford, but for it was his own, it was for his own good at the time, because it was, it was difficult for the young man, you know, the, the exposure he got from that game. Now, Sir Alex, he's well known amongst other managers, that he quite happily be someone you can call up for advice, is he someone that you've that you've spoken to over the years? Yeah, you know, we've got that, you know, we've got one thing in common that not a lot of people understand is, as you've highlighted in this <laughs> video, Chris, you know, it's, it's so, it's someone that does understand you, <laughs> but, 
you know, I've got good relationships with, with a lot of managers, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, deep down we are very competitive, but also I think that, you, you, you know, there's a mutual respect. And obviously coming from a you know, similar background to myself, you know, that there was a there was a sort of connection for one a better word that you know that was struck up and yeah we, we do touch base from that now and again. So moving on after that we're gonna leave um twelve thirteen season because we've got we're editing a separate documentary about that which we'll film something in the future. Yeah. So just just present day just to finish off um how exciting is it at the moment for you and your role with the uh, the academy plans and the work that's already underway? Yeah, well, really exciting. I think, you know, when I come back to the club three years ago, I've got many, many different roles in the football club, you know, but one of them was, it was really, really strong from Steve Parrish. You know, the, the academy's been neglected uh, since we were in the premiership. We've had to push all the money into the, into the team to survive, which I think was the right decision. He's, he really tasked me and said, look, I really want you to put a lot of energy into this the academy and we've got to get into cat one and we've got to build a new infrastructure so you know for the last couple of years we've been working very closely with Steve and Gary and you know a few of the guys down there to put in place what I think is going to be a wonderful uh, academy and, and hopefully for many many years to come we'll service, service the first team you know we're in a great area so we're going to spend a lot of money on, on, a, on, a, on a nice uh, the building's already there, but a real good refurb. Hopefully, push on to cap one. Uh, keep players, Chris. You know, keep players. Don't let them go to the Chelsea's and the Arsenal's. We see these these lofty cheeks and people like that are from our area. So keep them in our area. You know, I don't want a I don't want a flashy academy. I want an urban future. I want a place that represents our club and our area. I want to stay within the community, uh, and I want to have, and, and another job in mind is to have pathways from the, the academy right to the first team. So, for instance, you know, one of the areas that the managers highlighted that we've we'll, we'll Patrick, got Patrick uh, playing left back, but we haven't got much of a cover there. And, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm looking at it and thinking, shall we go out there and buy a left back? You know, I've got my recruitment team that's, you know, we recruit all around the world, Chris, you know, and very proud of that. We've got a team that's at the top of a button, press of a button. We, we know every left back in the world. But then I look at young Tarek Mitchell, who's coming from the academy, and, you know, so it's to make, not only put the infrastructure in place, to actually create pathways that allows these young gentlemen to have opportunities in life. So it's something that we are all very proud of. It's a very, it's a huge effort. You know, we're working towards, still working towards it, but I think uh, over the next year or so, you know, it's something we're, we're all going to be very proud of. Perfect. I think we'll leave... We'll leave things there. Thank you very much for taking time out of your what, day of Zoom meetings. Yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm running late. I'm at 11 o'clock soon, so I know you should really cut your crust and okay, catch cool. your shirt, mate. Yeah, get rid of me. Cheers, Dougie. Go that on. was brilliant.